Volume One, Letters Thirty Seven through Forty Two of the History of Emily Montague. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Emily Montague, Volume One, by Francis Moore Brooke. Letters Thirty Seven through Forty Two. Read by Amanda Friday as Arabella Fermor. Kit Nusis, as Edward Rivers. Letter thirty seven. To Miss Rivers, Clare Street, Sillery, October fifteen. Our wanderer is returned, my dear, and in such spirits as you can't conceive. He passed yesterday with us. He likes to have us to himself, and he had yesterday. We walked our trio in the wood, and were foolish. I have not passed so agreeable a day since I came to Canada. I love mightily to be foolish, and the people here have no taste that way at all. Your brother is divinely so upon occasion. The weather was, to use the Canadian phrase, superb et magnifique. We shall not, I am told, have much more in the same magnifique style, so we intend to make the most of it. I have ordered your brother to come and walk with us from morning till night, every day in all the day. The dear man was amazingly overjoyed to see us again. We shared in his joy, though my little Emily took some pains to appear tranquil on the occasion. I never saw more pleasure in the countenances of two people in my life, nor more pains taken to suppress it. Do you know Fitzgerald is really an agreeable fellow? I have an admirable natural instinct. I perceived he had understanding, from his aquiline nose and his eagle eye, which are indexes I never knew fail. I believe we are going to be great. I am not sure I shall not admit him to make up a parte quore with your brother and Emily. I told him my original plot upon him, and he was immensely pleased with it. I almost fancy he can be foolish. In that case my business is done. If with his other merits he has that, I am a lost woman. He has excellent sense, great good nature, and the true princely spirit of an Irishman. He will be ruined here, but that is his affair, not mine. He changed quarters with an officer now at Montreal, and because the lodgings were to be furnished, thought himself obliged to leave three months' wine in the cellars. His person is pleasing. He has good eyes and teeth, the only beauties I require, is marked with a smallpox, which in men gives a sensible look, very manly, and looks extremely like a gentleman. He comes, the conqueror comes. I see him plainly through the trees. He is now in full view, within twenty yards of the house. He looks particularly well on horseback, Lucy, which is one certain proof of a good education. The fellow is well born, and has ideas of things. I think I shall admit him of my train. Emily wonders I have never been in love. The cause is clear. I have prevented any attachment to one man by constantly flirting with twenty. Tis the most sovereign receipt in the world. I think, too, my dear, you have maintained a sort of running fight with the little deity. Our hour is not yet come. Adieu. Yours, A. Fermor. Letter 38. To Miss Rivers, Clarges Street, Quebec, October 15th, evening. I am returned, my dear, and have had the pleasure of hearing you and my mother are well, though I have had no letters from either of you. Mr. Temple, my dearest Lucy, tells me he has visited you. Will you pardon me a freedom which nothing but the most tender friendship can warrant when I tell you that I would wish you to be as little acquainted with him as politeness allows? He is a most agreeable man, perhaps too agreeable, with a thousand amiable qualities. He is the man I love above all others, and, where women are not concerned, a man of the most unblemished honour. But his manner of life is extremely libertine, and his ideas of women unworthy the rest of his character. He knows not the perfections which adorn the valuable part of your sex. He is a stranger to your virtues, and incapable, at least I fear so, of that tender affection which alone can make an amiable woman happy. With all this he is polite and attentive, and has a manner which, without intending it, is calculated to deceive women into an opinion of his being attached when he is not. He has all the splendid virtues which command esteem, is noble, generous, disinterested, open, brave, and is the most dangerous man on earth to a woman of honour who is unacquainted with the arts of man. Do not, however, mistake me, my Lucy, I know him to be as incapable of forming improper designs on you, even were you not the sister of his friends, as you are of listening to him if he did. Tis for your heart alone I am alarmed. He is formed to please. You are young and inexperienced, and have not yet loved. My anxiety for your peace makes me dread your loving a man whose views are not turned to marriage, and who is therefore incapable of returning properly the tenderness of a woman of honour. I have seen my divine Emily. Her manner of receiving me was very flattering. I cannot doubt her friendship for me, yet I am not absolutely content. I am, however, convinced by the easy tranquillity of her air, 
and her manner of bearing this delay of their marriage, that she does not love the man for whom she is intended. She has been a victim to the avarice of her friends. I would fain hope, yet what have I to hope? If I had even the happiness to be agreeable to her, if she was disengaged from Sir George, my fortune makes it impossible for me to marry her, without reducing her to indigence at home, or dooming her to be in exile in Canada for life. I dare not ask myself what I wish or intend, yet I give way in spite of me to the delight of seeing and conversing with her. I must not look forward. I will only enjoy the present pleasure of believing myself one of the first in her esteem and friendship, and of showing her all those little pleasing attentions so dear to a sensible heart, attentions in which her lover is astonishingly remiss. He is at Montreal, and I am told was gay and happy on his journey thither, though he left his mistress behind. I have spent two very happy days at Soleri with Emily and your friend Bill Firma. Tomorrow I meet them at the Governor's, where there is a very agreeable assembly on Thursday evenings. Adieu. Yours, Ed Rivers. I shall write again by a ship which sails next week. Letter 39 To John Temple, Esquire, Pall Mall, Quebec, October 18th. I have this moment a letter from Madame de Roche, the lady at whose house I spent a week, and to whom I am greatly obliged. I am so happy as to have an opportunity of rendering her a service, in which I must desire your assistance. Tis in regard to some lands belonging to her, which, not being settled, some other person has applied for a grant of at home. I send you the particulars, and beg you will lose no time in entering a caveat, and taking other proper steps to prevent what would be an act of great injustice. The war and the incursions of the Indians in alliance with us, have hitherto prevented these lands from being settled. But Madame de Roche is actually in treaty with some Acadians to settle them immediately. Employ all your friends as well as mine, if necessary. My lawyer will direct you in what manner to apply and pay the expenses attending the application. Adieu. Yours, Ed Rivers. Letter 40. To Miss Rivers, Clare Street, Sillery, October 20. I danced last night till four o'clock in the morning, if you will allow the expression— "'Without being the least fatigued, the little Fitzgerald was my partner, who grows upon me extremely. "'The monkey has a way of being attentive and careless by turns, which has an amazing effect. "'Nothing attaches a woman of my temper so much to a lover as her being a little in fear of losing him, "'and he keeps up the spirit of the thing admirably. "'Your brother and Emily danced together, and I think I never saw either of them look so handsome. "'She was a thousand times more admired at this ball than the first, and reason good, for she was a thousand times more agreeable.' "'Your brother is really a charming fellow. "'He is an immense favourite with the ladies. "'He has that very pleasing general attention, "'which never fails to charm women. "'He can even be particular to one, "'without wounding the vanity of the rest. "'If he was in company with twenty, "'his mistress of the number, "'his manner would be such "'that every woman there would think herself "'the second in his esteem. "'And that, if his heart had not been "'unluckily pre-engaged, "'she herself should have been "'the object of his tenderness. "'His eyes are of immense use to him.' He looks the civilest things imaginable. His whole countenance speaks whatever he wishes to say. He has the least occasion for words to explain himself of any man I ever knew. Fitzgerald has eyes, too, I assure you, and eyes that know how to speak. He has a look of saucy unconcern and inattention, which is really irresistible. We have had a great deal of snow already, but it melts away. Tis a lovely day, but an odd enough mixture of summer and winter. In some places you see half a foot of snow lying, in others the dust is even troublesome. Adieu, there are a dozen of two of bows at the door. Yours, A. Furmore. Letter 41 To Miss Rivers, Clare Street, November 10. The savages assure us, my dear, on the information of the beavers, that we shall have a very mild winter. It seems these creatures have laid in a less winter stock than usual. I take it very ill, Lucy, that the beavers have better intelligence than we have. We have got into a pretty composed easy way— Sir George writes very agreeable, sensible, sentimental, gossiping letters, once a fortnight, which Emily answers in due course, with all the regularity of a counting-house correspondence. He talks of coming down after Christmas. We expect him without impatience, and in the meantime amuse ourselves as well as we can, and soften the pain of absence by the attention of a man that I fancy we like quite as well. With submission to the beavers, the weather is very cold, and we have had a great deal of snow already, but they tell me tis nothing to what we shall have. They are taking precautions which make me shudder beforehand, pasting up the windows and not leaving an avenue where cold can enter. I like the winter carriages immensely. The open carriole is a kind of one-horse chaise, the covered one a chariot, set on a sledge to run on the ice. We have not yet had snow enough to use them, but I like their appearance prodigiously. 
the covered carrioles seem the prettiest things in nature to make love in as there are curtains to draw before the windows we shall have three in effect my father's rivers's and fitzgerald's the two latter are to be elegants themselves and entirely for the service of the ladies your brother and fitzgerald are trying who shall be ruined first for the honour of their country i will bet three to one upon ireland they are every day contriving parties of pleasure and making the most gallant little presents imaginable to the ladies adieu my dear yours a fermore letter forty two to miss rivers quebec november fourteenth i shall not my dear have above one more opportunity of writing to you by the ships after which we can only write by the packet once a month my emily is every day more lovely i see her often and every hour discover new charms in her she has an exalted understanding improved by all the knowledge which is becoming in your sex a soul awake to all the finer sensations of the heart checked and adorned by the native gentleness of woman she is extremely handsome but she would please every feeling heart if she was not she has the soul of beauty without feminine softness and delicate sensibility no features can give loveliness with them very indifferent ones can charm that sensibility that softness never was so lovely as an emily i can write on no other subject were you to see her my lucy you would forgive me my letter is called for adieu yours ed rivers your friend miss firma will write you everything End of letters thirty seven through forty two